Okay, thank you. Um, so normally we will have a quiz on lecture day and that quiz will be taken through Canvas. So you'll need to log in on lecture days, Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, take the quiz, you'll have all day to do it. It'll be available from eight in the morning till midnight. Um, they're usually a 10 minute quiz. They're not too horribly long. And we'll talk about that soon too. But that will serve as your attendance um, and your lab reports being turned in will serve as your attendance. I need to know when you guys are in class. And this will tell me like the last time you logged in. So I know. Um, as far as grading, if you just drop out of sight um, and I don't have enough work for you to have a grade or you would get an F, you'll get what's called a WF and I need to give them the last day that you attended. Um, so I need to know when you attended. And that's how I'll do attendance. As far as um, being here or leaving, I'm fine with you guys dropping in and out. You don't need to tell me you guys are adults. If you've got something to go do and you only stay for the first 10 minutes of class, it's fine. Um, I, I'm fine with that. Just make sure that you're accessing material and getting work done. Um, summer is a bit crazy. You guys already know that, right? We have eight weeks to do what we would normally do in 16, which means that we're doing double the workload every week. Um, so anyway, let me get started. Um, I'm going to introduce myself. And then what we're going to do today is obviously go over the syllabus, which you do everywhere. And then we're going to go over some um, chapter one and chapter three, which is basically all math. I don't want that to scare you away. Um, on Wednesday, we're going to have a lecture on, um, on actually doing some problems um, with acceleration. So, um, and one dimensional motion. So, we're always going to be doing a lot of math, right? But um, today it's a lot of math. And um, it's all stuff you hopefully have already seen in calculus, in your calculus courses, your algebra courses. There's some of it that you may have forgotten or may have never really learned. Um, we'll talk about that. So first of all, um, before I get started on this, We'll always have blank PowerPoints. Um, if you go to our Canvas page, you can see there's the Zoom invite, which is our daily Zoom invite. Um, there's a link to the resources on IBC. There are some IO Lab stuff that we'll talk about. There is a syllabus link. There are lab handout links, and there are the blank PowerPoints. What these are, are if you look at them, they're exactly what they say. They're my basically lecture notes, okay? You could print those out, you could download them and write on them if you have a stylus, um, but they're there for you to kind of follow along with the lecture. We also have an assignments page, which um, I know this is a little bit different in student view, but in your assignments, and I don't know why this thing, it's really annoying. There is no roll call assignment You'll see that there's all the homeworks up through chapter six, which is the first up to the first exam are already available to you and they're all due on the same day. And that's because I want you guys to be able to work at your own pace, work ahead really of where we're at, but you can see them if you wanna work on them, work on them. We'll talk more about that soon. There's also some quizzes that we'll talk about. There's some lab reports that are already put in of what day they're due and we'll talk about that as well. Um, and so as Mina said, uh, there's a discord for the class. If you guys want to have a discord for class, I'm perfectly cool with that. I don't need to be in. Um, the only thing I will say is it can't be on during exams. Um, I don't want you guys checking things during exams um, like that, but I'm totally happy with you guys having a discord and we'll talk about that soon. Um, okay, so let's get started with this. I'm going to i put this off behind me. Um, as I said, this is Physics 4A, summer 2021. 
my name is James. Um, I've been an instructor at IBC for about two and a half years. Um, I actually have a very kind of complex history that I don't want to bore you with too much. Um, I basically was a non-traditional student. I was working while my wife got her master's and doctorate in counseling and education. And I went back to school um, when I was around 30 uh, to what is called Central New Mexico Community College. I got my liberal arts degree and enrolled at the University of New Mexico um, as an astrophysics major for my undergrad. After two and a half years going through that, uh, my wife actually had got her doctorate and wanted to come back to San Bernardino, Riverside, where I live, um, and got a position at Cal State San Bernardino. So I left UNM to finish my physics degree at one of the UCs and ended up taking classes at Cal State while I was waiting to get into the UCs, finished up at Cal State San Bernardino as a physics major. Did a NASA internship in theoretical uh, biophysics, which I'll talk to anyone who wants about but I've been an NASA intern. Um, then I got into UC Irvine, again, as an astrophysics major. Um, turned out I really, really wasn't happy um, in grad school as an astrophysicist. And I ended up changing to a biophysics lab and finished my master's doing what are called nanopores, um, desalinization, which is taking salt and and impurities out of water um, using what are called nanopores um, as a biophysicist. That's actually biophysics. So I ended up in a biophysics lab. Um, strangely, I don't know why. Uh, as soon as I got done with my master's, I was fortunate to have contacts at Cal State San Bernardino who knew me and wanted me to teach there. And I taught a semester there. And while I was there, I met the chair of our department, Alec. And Alex said, hey, why don't you come apply at IBC? I started at IBC, and I've been here ever since. Um, and I love it. I love teaching you guys, um, particularly because you're motivated to get into a UC or get into a four-year. And, and it shows that, that we're not just hanging around. You, know, you guys are definitely trying to get somewhere. So um, with that in mind, what is this course? This course, um, no, uh, I'll, I'll talk about that some other time, Sam. Um, it, astrophysics is my first love. I love astrophysics. It's challenging, it's daunting, but the reason why I shifted was I wanted to look for moons around what are called extrasolar planets, planets around other suns. I was really hoping to be looking for moons. Um, and we were supposed to have a, a extrasolar specialist coming to UCI when I was there and they didn't arrive. They weren't there my first year. So I'm kind of floating. And I'd happened to be a TA for who became my PI, Susanna Siwi. Um, and she said, hey, please come work in my lab for me. And so I did. Um, that shift wasn't that big and, and I got to use a lot of my skills. I've also been an auto mechanic. Um, so I got to do a lot of research and, and helping build and code some stuff, um, which was useful, which you don't typically do in astrophysics. You basically analyze data. Um, so that was fun. Uh, as far as what I didn't like, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's a lot of, of repetitiveness on the astrophysics side that I just really wasn't happy with. Um, it, it just, you guys will get to know me over summer. I'm kind of scattered. I'm always thinking about a million things and I get bored easily. And I just, it was boring me, which is great. Um, you guys can always, life is, is about finding things you're passionate about. And if you're not passionate about something, changing course, finding something new. So anyway, um, that being said, what is this course and what are you gonna learn? And this is all a bunch of mumbo jumbo. I'm gonna put it in plain English for you guys. This course, we're going to study motion. Basically, whether it's 
car accident, like how a car decelerated and the forces on a person, whether it's cells flowing through a, a, a vein, um, whether it's a projectile falling or a satellite floating above the earth, we're going to study motion and how to understand that motion and put it into a theoretical model and eventually compare that theoretical model in our labs to real world data. Real world data is messy and gross, but we're gonna look at how well our theoretical models that we learn compare to reality in our labs. Uh, on a little bit higher level, what I hope you, you will learn is this is the first physics course for a lot of you. And I know that. Physics is very different from a lot of the other things you've done. Um, if you're a math major, you might find that you struggle horribly bad, even though you're great at math and the math is easy in that class. You might find you struggle. Why? Well, the reason why you struggle is because you don't know how to solve a physics problem where there is no roadmap, where you're just given a couple pieces of information and you need to infer or find a solution. And I don't mean to pick on math majors. Sometimes chemistry majors, bio majors, you guys are used to having a rule book. And in physics, a lot of times we don't have a rule book. We don't have any idea how to solve a problem. Even if it looks like a problem, we know how to solve it. So my goal is to give you guys some strategies to start, um, to, to kind of start using and get used to having that you can sit down and make it as painless as possible. Whether that's doing what are called free body diagrams and turning those into equations, um, whether it's just practicing, you know, um, finding variables that you may not know. Um, let me give you an example. Um, a lot of times you won't be told that there's gravity in a problem. Like if I said, oh, a, a ball has dropped um, from a height of 10 meters, how fast does it hit the ground? If you don't know what gravity is or how to handle that problem, there's nothing that you're being told. You have to assume a lot of things in that problem. So we're gonna hopefully get you guys learning what assumptions you should make. Um, and then I'm gonna tell you guys this. I'm a physicist. Physicists are the laziest mathematicians you've ever met. We come up with ways to make the math easy because we don't wanna do hard math. And we'll like kind of learn some of those tricks. And I shouldn't call them tricks, but ways to make problems simpler to solve. Um, and then finally, of course, we're gonna do some lab experiments. Those lab experiments, there's also a higher purpose to those. And that's that I wanna get you guys into writing quality lab reports, which somewhat mirror papers, research papers. So we're gonna have data and we're gonna have you know conclusions and we're gonna have some analysis and stuff to do. Um, but just remember, overall we're studying motion. But what we're really learning in this class is problem solving and lab report writing, to be honest. Um, this week, what we're gonna do, today I'm gonna talk about math and some math you should know. On Wednesday, I'm gonna talk about one dimensional motion. We're gonna introduce the simplest types of motion and velocity and acceleration and some problems, some cool problems to do with that. Um, on tomorrow, I'm gonna go through how to set up your IO lab and we'll talk about that. Um, and you'll have a, a quick IO lab thing to do. And then we have a graphing and uncertainty lab. That lab's super fast, and I want you to do that one on your own. Um, on, I believe, let me double check on the syllabus. So going to home, going to syllabus, I believe we have a measurement um, lab on Thursday. So on Thursday, we're going to do a lab of measurement. Really, what that lab is, is to we're going to um, measure a cube, a sphere, you know, a rectangle, and we're going to get some density figures. We're going to weigh them. We're going to measure them. 
and just make sure that you guys understand uncertainties and how to calculate uncertainties. Um, it's not too hard. So um, now's the part that I need to ask you guys to do me a favor. Um, physics can scare the crud out of you. Um, physics is scary because you have to be wrong. Um, what do I mean by that? You have to learn physics. I think of it like playing piano. So if you've ever played a musical instrument, you suck at first. You're bad. You can't hit things in time, right? You got to let yourself be bad in this class. You got to let yourself be wrong. What I mean by that is don't go to the internet to find the answer, to look up the homework problem. Um, don't run and try and have someone else give you the answer. You can't memorize these things. What you can do is try them a bunch of times. So um, what I would do if you want to be successful is make sure you're reading the textbook. What do I mean by reading the textbook? Well, let me jump over to here real fast. In your Wiley course resources, which you should have with your Wiley Plus, there is a textbook here. You can also go to the chapter. When you go through and read these, when I'm in the chapter, you can see that there's all these references, videos, which are like um, Khan Academy kind of, but then it's one-on-one. -on -one. Um, this will take me to the online. This is actually the beauty. There's some things I really hate about our, our book, but the beautiful thing is that it's got all this nice integrated uh, online. So let me turn this, turn this over a little. Um, okay. So this is chapter one, it's all online. Make sure you kind of skim read it before we do the chapter. Um, so you can kind of understand what they're talking about here. Length, sig figs, time, blah, blah, blah. I'm not gonna go through all this, but um, so if you skim through it, come to lecture and listen to me talk or, or at least watch the lecture, um, Read it enough that you understand what I'm talking about, but you don't have to read it in depth. After the lecture, go through and read it in depth. Highlight stuff. Um, try sample problems. Try problems that are in the book. So if you've never done that, so let's say there is, I don't know if there's any problems actually in this chapter. Um, so density and liquefaction, try doing this, um, on your own, try to see if you can get through this problem and find the density of sand, let's say, cover up the solution and try it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. Great. But those example problems in the book usually have something to teach you. They're usually kind of a weird problem or a totally simple problem, then try to do the homework. Now, here's the thing, you guys. I know all the homework is online. You can Google every single problem that's in the book. It's on Chegg. It's on wherever. That's why our homework's only worth 10%. Um, if I could, I would write all my own problems so that you couldn't do that. But I know they're online. However, Let's say we have two students. Student A tries them on their own, struggles, they're getting them wrong, and then asks their other friends in class, and they talk about it with their other friends and they figure out what they're doing wrong. Student B tries it, doesn't know what they're doing, goes online, copies down the solution, does their homework. Which one learns? the student that actually tries and gets it wrong and struggles and does it with their friends. Um, sometimes you need to give yourself time to think. My poor wife used to have to deal with me waking up at three o'clock in the morning and thinking I had had a, a really hard problem solved. I would write it out, I'd be up for an hour and I'd be wrong again. Um, I'd wake up with an idea of how to fix, you know, how to, how to solve something and I'd be wrong. But the thing was, I had to give myself time to kind of let them sink in when I didn't understand something. Um, the third thing that I'm going to say is teach others. So you're going to be in lab groups. 
but get in your lab groups and do homework. Do homework on that Discord. Don't just get on there for answers. Get on there and help other people. You guys all know this, right? If you know how to do something, you really figure out if you know how to do it by teaching someone else. So show someone else how to do the homework that you know how to do and let them show you the problems that they have figured out. It'll help both of you, to be honest. So basically the, the thing is do problems, do problems, do problems, do problems. Honestly, you can't memorize this stuff. Now, does that mean that you shouldn't go online? Well, look, you guys need your grades. Your grades are important, right? So if you need to get online, if you absolutely don't have time to solve these problems, yes, getting online, getting the answers and going through them it is probably gonna be what you have to do. I know that you guys need to get this stuff done. But if you can, if you can put some time you know, in your day, even like 15 minutes, um, take 15 minutes and just work on some problems. Um, if you don't have other people that you really wanna to talk to, if you don't wanna to talk to people, that's fine. But here's the thing, explain the problems to your little sisters, explain them to your mom or dad. No, um, Ava, um, so let's talk about that really fast. If I go into homeworks, and like I said, if I haven't said it already um, to you guys, the homeworks are all already up for the first five. Um, if you click on this and you can practice is the only one that isn't due the day of exam one, which is basically three and a half weeks away. If you click on this, you're going to be in Wiley Plus. If you don't have the Wiley Plus, you need to get it. Um, but if you click on a question, um, notice there are links. E-textbook and media will take you to the relevant part of the book and media will give you some basic help, like a video help on. I want to give you a little example of how to convert units. Okay. I'm not going to watch that, but it'll, it'll help you. So you can go through that. I also have the hints open for you in case you need those. Um, so basically in Wiley Plus, the beauty of it is it's all integrated. It's all, you know, there's a bunch of resources if you want them. Okay. There's a solution for me, but you won't have that solution. But <coughs> um, you have 10 tries. What does that mean? That means that you have plenty of, of chances to get this right and figure out if you've got something wrong. Now, listen up, because this is really important. Wiley is awful. Um, Wiley is very specific about things. It rounds things in weird ways sometimes. So if you're sure that you're doing it right and Wiley is telling you it's wrong, don't use up all your tries. Um, get a hold of me and we can figure out what's going wrong. Um, if you're sure you're right and you've done your math correctly and Wiley's telling you it's wrong. Um, and then if you do use up all your tries because something stupid happens, text me and say, hey, I, I used up all my tries. Can you reset that problem for me? What I care about is that you're doing it. Um, so I give you plenty of, of, of options to get it knocked out. So it's not graded on your accuracy so much. You have 10 chances. And if you do this with other friends in class, you guys can kind of pull, you know, so it's not like you only have five chances. And if you get it wrong, you're screwed. Um, I want you to do your homework and I want you to get it right and understand why you're getting it wrong. Um, but it's really important too, to get things wrong. So that brings me to my next point. We have some class etiquette here. We are online. If, um, if someone, you know, all of a sudden Zoom bombs us or whatever, I'll kick them out. <laughs> if you're accidentally got your mic on, I'll probably mute it. But the other side of class etiquette is we're all learning. So we all need to be respectful. And that's not just here. If you guys have a discord and someone's, you know, harassing you on discord, let me know. And I'll talk to them. Um, anything school related, 
no harassment. And if someone asks dumb questions, if someone's asking a million questions and you're feeling irritated by it, yeah, I know, I've been a student too. Um, but understand that they're learning and eventually you're going to want to be that person who's asking a million questions. Um, so the other thing is you may have your way of, of learning and think that you understand things and that someone else is totally not getting it, but help them. See if you can help them. Let's talk about it um, because you don't really know if you understand until you start trying to explain it to someone. And if you guys haven't had that happen yet, uh, try explaining something that you think you know and you realize you don't know halfway through the conversation. It's pretty humbling. Um, so just help people is what I'm saying. Um, but the other side of that coin is respect yourself. You may think that you are really great at math. And so you feel like you should have physics down without even trying. That's not true. I've met people who had never had a physics class in their life who took to it like a fish to water. And I've had students who have already been through a bunch of science classes and physics just freaks them out. Um, and the only thing I can kind of put that down to is they're not allowing themselves to learn. They think that they should just know it. Um, if you guys haven't learned this yet, I know some of you are new, some of you have been doing classes already quite a bit, but eventually you're going to get to a class that completely kicks your butt, that you're just really bad at. You're bad at even when you try. That's a good thing, know, know that, because if you wanna be successful in grad school, as you go forward, you have to learn how to learn. So if physics is hard for you, take it as an opportunity to learn how to study. I was the kid in class who didn't have to study. I could memorize things and I just kind of got things. And then I got to classes that were actually somewhat hard where I had to study things and do things over and over. And I didn't know how to do it. I had to teach myself how to learn again. Um, and the one thing that's going to short circuit that is if you cheat yourself by going online and just getting solutions, getting solutions from other people, letting other people do the work for you. You got to do the work. If you're not getting it while you're doing the work, ask for help. As I've said, um, my phone number is at the top of the, of the syllabus. Feel free to text me. Feel free to email me if you need time. For a Zoom, we can Zoom. I will do my best to be available 24 seven to you guys. Um, that being said, uh, we are here eight to 11, Monday through Thursday. On Tuesdays and Thursdays, I'm doing 4B labs for Dr. Simmons' class. So from 11 to two on Tuesdays and Thursdays, I won't be available. But basically any other time you can text me. If it's a quick question on a homework problem, or just something you're worried about or something you're worried about on your lab, I can usually answer it in a text like that. And I always have my phone with me. If it's something longer or if you're having a concern, um, you can always email me or if you just don't like texting, um, I will never put your name in my phone. I won't put you in my contacts. Um, I tend to delete all my messages. So if my phone was hacked, you know, someone's not gonna get your message or your, your number. Um, <clears throat> I also don't share any of that with anybody. So, um, just however you're, however you're most comfortable, um, getting a hold of me, feel free. Um, uh, if you can get the 12 month access, Ava, um, do it. We'll talk about that when we get to the syllabus in a second. Um, but yeah, um, let me do uh, one thing and then we'll we'll talk about the syllabus, Ava. Oh, by the way, I am absolutely horrible with names. If I pronounce your name wrong, um, please let me know. Um, 
I just have a thing with names. I'm one of those people that can't get names straight ever. Um, and then also, I don't know you guys by face since I'm not seeing you, um, which if I accidentally call you the wrong name or I accidentally use the wrong gender, know that that sometimes I'm looking at a name and I'm assuming, you know, it's a, it's a woman's name or a guy's name. And I may be wrong. Um, I try not to do that, but if I send you an email and I say the wrong gender, I'm sorry. Basically, you guys are mostly just names until I actually see you on camera. And I try to give you guys as much privacy as I can. So just bear with me. I apologize if I mess up your name. Um, all right, so let's do something fun really fast. Something kind of thought, thoughtful and um, kind of the point of this course. Um, some of you may know who Isaac Newton was. Um, basically modern classical is what they call it. I shouldn't call it modern. Classical physics begins with this guy, Isaac Newton. He was a mathematician um, in England during the time of the Black Plague, which is kind of funny because imagine time of COVID. Um, he went to his family's estate so that he wouldn't be around people, so he wouldn't get sick. Um, he went and kind of hid himself away. And while he was there, there's this story that he was sitting under a tree and an apple hit him on the head. Um, that story is fake. But he was supposedly watching the world and he used the apple as an example. And I want you to think about this. I want you to put yourself in Newton's shoes. Take a pen, take a, a pencil, take whatever you want, right, that you have in front of you. I have a guitar picked in front of me. Hold it in your hand and let it go. And it drops. And the question is why? Okay. Now, you might say, well, gravity. But that's what I want you to think about. That was Newton's question was why? Why if you let something go, does it fall straight down and only straight down? It doesn't fall sideways. Um, it falls straight down. And they knew things like the earth was rotating. Um, and it's just, it's a weird phenomenon. Like I said, you, you already have ingrained in your head. Gravity makes things fall down. Gravity is why I'm sitting in a chair right now and I'm not, you know, floating out of my chair. Gravity is holding me down. But what is gravity? And can you make a prediction? If you drop something, can you predict how fast it will fall, how long it will take in terms of seconds, and how fast it will be going when it hits the ground? And then furthermore, can you tell me what gravity is? Um, just what it is. Now, Newton had an answer to that, and we'll talk about that more chapter four. But his answer was, well, it seems that every mass connects to every other mass and they attract each other. All matter is made of something called mass and we'll talk about that. Um, it's quite a leap to come up with terms like force and mass. We take them for granted that we know what a force is, but Newton had to define that there was something called a force that made an apple fall to the ground. And that force was the force of gravity. He had to define acceleration and mass. Mass is something totally different. We'll talk about that uh, in a little bit. But that was all he tried to do. And the problem was when you talk about the earth, you gotta know that Newton was very thorough. Newton at the time, because he didn't have kind of a standard math to rely on, he had to prove things by examples. So he would give you a million examples of things that fall straight down to prove to you that things fall straight down. Um, but he realized pretty quickly that, okay, if the apple is falling towards this little piece of mass, but the earth is made up of, you know, 
a billion pieces of mass, that to do this correctly, he was going to have to have it, a force of gravity between the apple and every single little tiny piece of mass. That happily is a summation, meaning you can add those forces all together. And when you have a really, really big sum, that is an integral. And so what Newton figured out was calculus. He came up with integral calculus and he did it because he needed to figure out how fast something would fall to the earth when you dropped it. You might hate him for that because calculus is hard, but it's actually kind of cool that he created math to basically give him a theoretical model of what should happen if you drop something and a lot of other, other he came up with a lot of other math, but um, the other side of calculus is the derivative and that's Leibniz, which was another guy around the same time. It basically undoes an integral and we'll talk about that today. But what I want you to think about today is just as you go through your day, if you don't know what gravity is, and we'll find that out by the end of this course, what it really is, see if you can explain gravity to someone. Um, imagine someone didn't know what gravity was. Can you explain it? Can you explain why things fall straight down? And does it make sense that that's the way the world works? Um, it's a pretty huge logic leap. Um, it's pretty crazy to not only think, okay, well, I'm going to come up with my own terminology for what's going on. And then I'm going to make a mathematical model that'll give me pretty good answers for, or pretty good predictions that match. Um, that's what Newton did. And that's kind of his path that we're going to follow. We're going to use algebra and calculus. <clears throat> There's not a lot of calculus in the class, so don't worry too much about that. But we, we are gonna use calculus to derive theoretical models. And you'll see that um, pretty quickly. Um, and we're going to study the motion of bodies um, or systems of bodies. And that's what we're gonna do. And eventually we'll get to gravity and how gravity works and what gravity really is. So let me go through the syllabus and then we go through this on your homepage. You'll see my syllabus is here. Um, I originally posted this and I forgot to change that time. So it says like 11 to something. Um, I'm sorry for that. As far as I've been told, all of our classes will be online. Um, they're not supposed to be able to switch that. Um, I know they're trying to get it so that we could have some lab days but with the teachers union and protecting people who may be sick or at least not in great health, um, we're just wanting to be as safe as possible for all of you and your families. So we wouldn't want you to have to come and then someone gets sick and before we know it, we've got things possibly out of control. We don't want anyone hurt, anyone in the hospital. So they're trying to do their absolute best to do it as safe as possible and follow whatever guidelines they're given. So what I've been told is I think in fall, we're gonna be back at least a few days a week, um, hopefully for tests, uh, but we'll see. This um, will take you to the resource page. Uh, that resource page is also here. And I know you guys probably already know it, but let's talk about this really fast. This is the IVC student page. And there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, obviously the course catalog, email, blah, blah, blah. Um, stuff about your student life. But there's also all of this stuff on health and mental health and resources for whatever issues you may be having. Um, there are also, um, you can, go through here and get laptops if you need laptops, if you need certain things, Student Success Center, Tutoring, Math Center, 
writing center, transfer center, all this stuff is here. I provided the link for you just to make sure that you guys have it. Um, but please, please know that if you're struggling with anything, I know being a student can be hard. Um, we all have families and we all have commitments and we all have you know, mental health things that we need to take care of on a daily basis. And if you're struggling and you need to talk to someone, talk to me. If you don't wanna to talk to me, go through that page. If that page isn't helping you and you need me to find you some better resources, feel free. I will do my best to help you as discreetly and privately as possible. Um, so anyway, that's our resources. Um, we will have an IO lab. Um, an IO lab is basically, hang on one second. I don't know where I put mine. This is an IO lab. This cool little device here can do a ton of things. Um, and we're gonna use it for our labs, basically the second half of our labs. The first few labs, we won't need it. <coughs> but it's got wheels, it's got an accelerometer. It can figure out which way it's twisting and turning. It's got a force gauge, all sorts of stuff. And in fact, tomorrow, I'm gonna take you through a quick lab on how to use it. Now, will you have it tomorrow? Well, that's really up to you. Um, if you go to the IO Lab instructions, it says summer flyer. This tells you the times you can pick it up. You can see you can pick them up today through Thursday, eight to four. Please go to main campus, pick these up or get someone to pick it up for you. I don't know that they'll mail it to you. Um, if you're having an issue, let me know, but I don't know that they'll mail it to you. You can also buy these or rent them, I think, through Macmillan. Um, there are other options, but we would prefer that you go by main campus and pick up your IO lab in person free of charge. Um, they gave you this little map that shows you supposedly where to pick it up. You can see it's in the north entrance, that lot 10. Um, now, when you do go to do that, please print this out and bring it with you signed, okay? So just print this out and sign it um, and give it to them because they're going to need that. So it's, it's actually faster for them if you just fill this out and bring it with you, okay? Um, <coughs> please get it this week. Um, if you're having problems, let me know. Email me and I'll try to figure stuff out for you. But please go by and pick it up this week, it's free. Um, and then, like I said, tomorrow we'll have a quick lab about getting it up and running. A quick, it's not even really a lab, it's just a getting your IO lab up. And you'll need to do a couple of things to show me that you got it actually working. Uh, but we'll talk about that tomorrow. So, um, you're actually going to probably find that these things are actually really cool and kind of fun to work with. Um, we have another thing to do with it that I'll tell you about when we get to quizzes. Now, um, my office hours are basically anytime you want them. We're online, right? Like I said, at the top of the syllabus, that is my personal phone number. Feel free to text me if you're having a quick question on homework or whatever. If um, you need to email me, email me. That's fine too. My email is right here. Um, just contact me. And if we need to do Zoom, if we can do Zoom, we'll Zoom. Any issues you're having, want to go over how to do an, a, a calculation on your homework or on a lab report, great. I'm more than happy to. And um, you'll find I'm friendly. I'm not gonna get mad or irritated with you. If you send me dumb questions, I'll try my best to help you ASAP. Um, and really, if I'm awake and my phone's on, I'll answer it. So if you text me at 11 and I happen to be awake, I'll answer it. If not, I'll get back to you the next day. Um, if I don't get back to you on something, it means I don't know the answer and I'm gonna talk to you in person about it. 
or I forgot. So um, if it takes me a little while to get back to you, just let me know. Um, all right, dropping this class. There is a page on admissions that gives you the date to drop the class, which is usually census. I think it's pretty fast, like a week and a half or something. Um, I don't put that in the syllabus because I want you to go and make sure you get the exact date from admissions. I don't want to put anything wrong. But um, if I open this link in a new tab, it should take me to the correct, hopefully, um, 2021 um, summer open registration. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba, ba -ba -ba -ba. Um, I'm not sure where the uh, withdrawing from classes, important dates. Um, so I think if you go to our actual class, it'll tell you. Um, nope, tells you right here. So the drop date, um, that doesn't make any sense. The withdrawal date is 719. So you have until 719 to withdraw with a W. You had until the 13th of June to drop. That doesn't seem right, but okay. Um, yeah, anyway, um, I should also note, we do not have a, um, we do not have a class on the 5th of July, which is two weeks from today, I believe. Um, but yeah, so withdrawal, you can withdraw with a W by a 719. Just make sure that you know those dates. Um, I'm not gonna drop you. You need to drop yourself or withdraw yourself. Um, if you stop attending, I'm going to report the last day you attended. As I said, attendance is by whether you're doing your quizzes every lecture day, Monday and Wednesday, we'll have a short quiz. You can take sometime during the day, 10 minutes. You can just log into Canvas and take it. Um, and that'll be your attendance. And then on lab days, it's going to be when you turn in your lab report, I'm going to assume you were there for the labs for that week. Um, so no class, July 5th. Um, exams, we will have three of them and we'll go over that probably next week. Um, our first exam is the beginning of week four. And then, um, so we have this week, we're doing chapters one, three, and two. Next week, four and five. The week after, chapter six. We'll have a review on Thursday of week three. And then Monday of week four, we'll have an exam. So you'll have a whole weekend to um, basically um, study. Chapter six is actually just some added stuff to chapter five. So really you'll have this whole week to study for exam one. Um, and then week four, we're gonna do energy and chapter 14, which is fluids that week. Um, that week is all about energy and we'll talk about it. Um, hang on a second, Nicole, Nicolette, I'm sorry. Um, then we'll do chapters nine and 10, and you can see week six, we'll have exam two. So week four to week six, that's a pretty fast turner. But this stuff is all about energy and it's not too bad um, and some buoyancy stuff. Then week six, week seven, week eight, um, we're going to have the rest of, of what we do. And we have a lot of stuff going on here, but those chapters are kind of independent of each other. Static equilibrium is a really fast chapter. Um, and chapter 15 and chapter 13 and 15 are gravity and oscillations. So anyway, we'll have three exams. Uh, let me go back really fast to, oh yeah, you can see it in, in my site. Thank you, uh, Lithica. Um, so this agreement has the wrong date. Oh, that's annoying. This is what they sent me. Is there a date on here? Oh, okay. So, um, Nicolette, um, 
we'll return it. Basically, we won't need it for the last week of class. And I think you'll have, um, I think you'll have after that, um, I think you'll have, so week eight, you should be able to turn it in, but I'll get you the flyer and the exact times or the week after that, you'll be able to turn it in. Um, but you can also ask them when you pick it up for sure. Um, basically, I just get sent flyers and information like, oh, these are the dates we're gonna do it um, because they have to coordinate it through the um, science facilities, you know, to have the people out there to, to take them in. Now, you will need to turn it in even if you're taking physics 4B or 4C with an IO lab as well. Um, the reason why is they want to make sure that there's no damage. So if you drop it and it breaks, um, you might be liable for damages. So be careful with it. Also check the batteries. We'll talk about that, but you will need to check your batteries. So anyway, um, our exams are found on the, the calendar. Um, typically, our exams will be four questions. Hi, Mina. So I got a quick question. So I know that we're supposed to pick up the IO lab, but like, but I don't know what is it. <laughs> like, I just want to like, I just want to ask like, what is the IO lab? IO lab in general. Can you see this device in my camera? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's basically a little box. It has a force sensor. It has a oh. wheels, and then it has a bunch of um, inputs because you can actually use it to do circuits and stuff. Oh, okay. It has a microphone, it has a light, it has a speaker. It it's a crazy little lab in a box. And oh okay, that makes sense. All we, right. We can get really nice graphs and data. It's nice. So okay, cool. Um, as you all should know, our our book is Fundamentals of Physics. You don't have to have the hard copy. Um, if you just get the Wiley Plus access, you should have access to the book as well. And the book is completely online. Um, right here in this top corner, Wiley Course Resources, if you go there, once you have your access or you can go there to get access, you can see that you actually should have the whole book, I believe. Um, but I wanna talk about something really important. Um, there's welcome to your Wiley Course, getting started, how to succeed, blah, blah, blah. There is also a help support here. You can launch the e-textbook. Um, this is a little bit of a pain because I think you have to have like a, a reader. Um, if I remember correctly, when I did this, I had to set up this vital source. Um, but you can go here and open it up and there is the complete textbook. Now, if I go to say measurement chapter, it's all here online, review and summary and problems. And you can see that there's a whole bunch of problems here. These are the same exact problems that we will have in Wiley Plus, same exact problems, except sometimes they're going to give you different answers or I mean different numbers. So you may have a two, your friend may have a four, right? Whatever. Now, in that though, if you go back to course-wide resources, there are additional sample problems, animated illustrations, references, math help videos, simulations, student solutions. Check. Um, um, yeah, Nicolette, um, I think your parent may be able to pick it up for you. Um, I don't completely quote me on that, um, but I, I believe that they allow parents to pick it up. Um, if it's not like right down, if you don't live very close, um, you might want to call and find out um, and see if you can find out from someone. Uh, but I think they allow parents, just so you know. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, okay, so 
in the student solution manual, you can see that there's not all of the problems. Now, to be honest with you, um, if you have Chegg or something like that, and I know a lot of you do, even Google, you can Google most of these problems anyway. So um, basically, I, instead of giving you a list of additional problems, what I would say is you can go into the problem and Google any problems you feel like are something you want to try. Or alternatively, if you're doing additional problems and you want to know the solution to them, let me know and I'll send you the solutions. Um, so if you feel that, that you're not getting enough homework problems and you want to do more, which you should probably do more, but let me know. I'll try to help you guys out. It's all here though. Um, these video sample problems are pretty nice. Um, like I said, they're one of like, the skills that you need for technical or scientific work. They're like a um, kind of a Khan Academy type deal. If I go here, nice. and the way we're going to take that into it, it's going to have to be. He kind of goes. We saw interview. for L. Okay, so basically, it's a really good interactive textbook for you. Hopefully, you'll find that you like it. Um, maybe you hate it. I don't know. Um, we will go through problems as well, but there's it's at a position on the act all sorts of cool stuff here. Um, how much of it you use is up to you. I'm not going to make you do any of this, but as far as our textbook, it is the online 11th edition of Fundamentals of Physics. There are a few things that I'll talk about that I don't like in our book. Um, I actually prefer University Physics by Young and Friedman. Um, University Physics is a pretty cool book. Um, if you can get the 11th edition, um, I believe it's the 11th. You may even be able to get it online. It's this one right here. So this book right here. Um, it actually covers everything that we cover in 4A, 4B, 4C. Um, I think that the derivations uh, are a little bit better. The problems are a little bit better than our book. I like the way they discuss things a little bit better. And I think it's actually slightly at a higher level um, for you. So if you're looking for another book to also supplement, uh, try University of Physics 11th edition by Young and I believe it's Young and Friedman. <coughs> But you still need Wiley Plus. So our textbook is Fundamentals of Physics Holiday by Wiley Publishing. All right. Uh, this is a course description, calculus-based introduction to classical mechanics, kinematics. Um, kinematics just means motion uh, in one and two dimensions, force and equilibrium, Newton law, particle dynamics, universal gravity, conservation, work and potential energy, collision, kinetic energy, or kinetic kinematics, dynamics of rigid bodies and oscillations. What that's saying is we're going to study basically forces and forces lead to acceleration, velocity, um, motion. Once we're done with forces, we're gonna to go to energy and energy is an alternative way to understand motion. Um, now, most of that is all gonna be in X, Y, Z. So then we'll move on to rotation. What happens when things are actually spinning around and around and around? Or what about when they are spinning on their own? So a ball that's spinning um, or a ball that is rotating around a pole, like imagine a tether ball. Um, so we need to go straight line motion to circular motion and we'll do that. Circular motion instead of forces has torques. We'll talk about that later. After that, we're gonna study gravity, fluids, and oscillations and pendulums. So that's kind of the map of this course. Up through exam one is one dimensional forces, acceleration, um, things like that. One and two dimensional, I should say. Projectile motion, free fall, 
what I call Newton's equations. Unit two is all energy and fluids. And then unit three is some diverse topics on other things that we're going to cover. So attendance is mandatory. If you aren't showing up, you aren't doing your work because you're not logging into the quizzes. However, um, let me say this to those of you who are worried. This is summer. We are going to be flying through this material. I understand that. Even if it wasn't summer, I feel that if you come and you do all of your work, meaning you do all the quizzes, you take them all, you don't have to get them all right, but you take them all and you honestly try them. You do all your homework and you honestly try to do your homework. You do all your lab reports, right? That's 35% there. As long as you do okay, you know, you don't completely get all zeros on your tests, you do okay, meaning maybe you get 40 to 60% on your tests, you're going to pass this class with at least a C. So that's my promise to you. If you come and you actually actively try and even if you're struggling through this stuff but you're trying and you're not missing assignments you'll pass this class okay so just hang in there now let's say you are worried now before you drop or before you withdraw um just talk to me and we'll see what's going on and if i can help you in some ways and if you don't want to withdraw and you don't want to waste your time um, i understand grades are important to all of you so how do you get an a well, in order to get an A, do all your work and do okay. I would say getting a 75 to an 85 on your test, you're going to get an A in the class. Meaning you can screw up some of your tests. It's okay. Um, you'll get an A. As long as you're doing all your work and you're showing me that you understand the stuff. You're going to find that my tests are, are yeah, um, my tests are a little on the long side, so I'm going to try and pair them back more, especially for summer. But you'll be given practice exams that will, I'll, I'll probably load them up next Monday for the first exam. So you'll have two weeks um, to prepare. Um, and we'll go through them. We'll also review stuff. And what you'll see is essentially what I do on an exam is I take what would be a normal question and I break it up. Um, so maybe it's free fall. I'll ask you for the variables. I'll ask you for a drawing. You know, show me what variables you're choosing. Um, give me the correct equations. And then I'll ask you to do the algebra and solve for something like maybe the maths. And then I'll ask you for the actual answer. And then usually I switch it up a little bit. Like what if it, instead of it falling, you would shot it straight up, something like that. But what you'll see is essentially what would normally be like, oh, here's the problem. And your teacher would have a rubric. I just take that rubric and I ask each of those things. You know, like a rubric would mean like, did they draw? It? Did they have the right variables? Did they do the algebra right? Did they use the right equation? I just ask you for that. So it's, it seems like more work, but it's actually I think more straightforward and it helps you more than just giving you a problem and expecting you to get me the answer at the end. Also, I'm not as concerned with answers, meaning let's say the mass is supposed to be two kilograms and you get 3.5 because you make an algebra mistake. That's not as big of a deal to me. What's the most important thing is that you can demonstrate the prop that the proper way to solve that you have like a logical way that you're solving the problem that you understand what concepts and equations are relevant to that problem and then yeah there are some points for doing the algebra right and getting the answers right but that's not the whole point of the problem the point of the problem is that you understand the concepts and you have a method to solve it and you understand how that method works It'll make more sense as we go um, and we'll talk about that. So um, what I will do is you'll download a copy of the exam. Um, if you want to write it on a tablet and save it as like a PDF, that's fine. 
Um, if you want to download it and print it out and write right on it, if you want to, um, if you want to um, write it, write your answers on separate paper, you just need to make sure that you tell me what part of each problem you're answering. And then what we'll do is we'll upload your answers or take photos of your pages and upload those um, to turn in your exam. Um, Hayun, I hope I'm saying that correctly. Um, there will be practice exams with solutions. Okay, so labs. Now, um, uh, Professor, just 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 one quick question about the uh, the study guide. Is it going to like reflect like what kind of questions that we might be getting on the exam, or yep. is it going to be okay? It it will be conceptually identical to your exam okay so okay yeah, 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 of course I, I mean obviously the numbers will be different but like yeah that's what i wanted to like get at and the reason that i asked this question is because i would ask professors in the past like would it be kind of like similar in terms of concept and then they would get like all you know frustrated on me and be like don't ask me that question so um, I, yeah so basically you guys are going to see that that the way the first six chapters break down is chapter one is nothing. Um, we're gonna talk about it in a minute, but um, chapter one is nothing. Chapter two is basically motion in a straight line, which includes free fall. Um, chapter three is all vector stuff, and we won't have specific stuff about that on the exam. So you'll have something like maybe a free fall problem. Chapter four is two-dimensional motion. And that includes something called projectile motion. Projectile motion is very important, super, super important. Um, and motion with constant acceleration is super important. Chapter five is something called Newtonian physics. Basically, there's a whole way to deal with stuff. We model everything as like blocks on inclined planes or on flat surfaces without friction in chapter five, with friction in chapter six. So there's a couple other little concepts in there that aren't too hard. But basically the first exam is gonna have something like a free fall problem or a constant acceleration problem. It'll have a projectile motion problem. It'll have a Newton's equations type problem without friction and with friction. And those will be the four. And you can expect it. So if you know how to do those problems, you'll be fine. Um, and I'll give you some examples of those problems to show you kind of what to deal with. And you'll see how that all works. Cool. All right. Awesome. Um, so labs. Now, you guys can work in groups of three in your labs. Uh, the first couple labs, or the first lab, um, I don't necessarily want you in groups. Uh, maybe I change that. I'll have to look. I might have actually wrote that you can't do it in groups. But basically, the first lab will be about making graphs, which is not the most fun. But I need to make sure that you understand how to make proper graphs. And then doing some uncertainty calculations, which, again, I need to make sure that you know how to do uncertainties. Um, but then after that, we're going to have like a measurement lab and a free fall lab. Some of these labs will use the IL lab. Some of them will not. Some of them, I will give you my data. What we'll, we will do is on the lab days, I'll go through and help you collect your data and I'll try to remember to tell you ahead of time what things you need. In general, you're going to need a ruler with uh, millimeter marks, hopefully. You can pick these up anywhere. A cheap one's fine, but get yourself a ruler with millimeters, centimeters, millimeters. Um, and a protractor. Um, I found these at the grocery store. Uh, if you can find them somewhere, uh, if you don't have them already. The protractor, you could actually print one out online. So just grab an image of a protractor and print it and cut it out, um, since the angles will obviously be the same. Um, but it's nice to have one. Um, but then I also get some strings. Um, Get about 20 coins, preferably pennies. Uh, if you can find like 20 pennies around somewhere, 
if you don't have pennies or you have coins from somewhere else, uh, that's probably fine. The nice thing about pennies is they give us some weight that we can um, use in experiments, which sounds kind of like, you know, junior high school experiments, but they actually uh, teach us a lot and they work well with the ILO. Um, one of the unfortunate things about being at home online is that we don't have access to our lab with all the nice equipment. But the IO lab works very well to do a lot of experiments that will be able to get um, data. So you'll have three of you working. Now, can you work by yourself? I would prefer, especially during summer, that you at least work in groups of two, if not in groups of three. Um, you might have had labs with other people where they break down one of you is the PI, one of you is the analyst, one of you is the data person. Um, how you get the lab report done is up to you. How you break things apart is up to you. Um, I'm not going to make the analysts turn in their part early and whatnot. Um, you guys are all responsible for getting your lab report done and turned in. Now, what if someone doesn't do their part? Okay, well, if someone doesn't do their part, then you need to email me if they're not talking to you. So if you had someone who was supposed to do the experiment, you contact them and they're not responding back, they ghosted you, contact me and I'll contact them and we'll figure it out. But if a lab report gets turned in and it's garbage, and then you say, oh, I didn't know, they did that work and they did it without me. You shouldn't let anyone turn in any work with your name on it that you haven't checked to make sure it's what you think. So it's up to you guys to make sure that what gets turned in for you is correct. Um, that being said, I have a policy that if you turn in a lab report and it's going to be scored below a 90, I'm gonna give it back to you and have you fix it. Usually that's because someone didn't include something, you forgot to include graphs or you forgot to include a table or you had something seriously messed up. Um, so if you turn your lab and it's like a 75 because you forgot something, I will let you know that it's wrong and you need to fix it, okay, um, before I grade it. So I'm not going to grade things that, that have issues. I'm just going to let you know that it's got issues and get it back to you. How do lab reports work? Well, there's an assignment for each of the labs. This week we're doing a lab on Wednesday and a lab on um, Thursday, which is measurement. So tomorrow we're doing an IO lab, which later on, um, once you get it, you'll be able to do. But we're also doing this graphing uncertainty lab and kind of learning about how I want lab reports tomorrow. And then Thursday we're doing measurement. But notice these are both due a week from Friday. So you'll have two weeks to do these. Well, a week and a half to do these. You'll basically have a week to get it done um, and back to me. Um, so you'll have a weekend to, to take care of it. Um, same with these two are, are then due a week later. I don't know why these are the ninth and this is the third. It's the third Saturday. So anyway, um, but these times we can push them a little bit back if you need, if you're not sure that you're going to have it done, um, we can push it back a day or two. They're set up for Friday so that if we need to push it back to Sunday, we can, right? Um, but remember, you're also going to need to study for your exam. This lab is a little iffy. Um, I don't, it's, this lab is to help you do vectors and understand vector multiplication. Freefall um, is a really easy, quick lab. Incline plane is a little iffy too. And then you're going to get that, and then you'll have your exam, and then you'll have the rest of the week after the exam to get the incline plane done. So um, I'm hoping that they won't interfere with your exams too much. Now, how do you turn it in? Well, you'll print it out as a PDF, and one of your group, one of the three of you, will attach it. Um, you'll also need a cover sheet. We'll go over all of that tomorrow when we talk about labs. So in the meantime, um, think about if you 
know some people in class and you want to work with them, great. Or if you know at least one other person, or if you guys can come up with people that you want to work with, let me know. Um, and then we'll talk tomorrow about groups and try to get you guys in groups. If you're not here tomorrow in class, um, I'll at least watch the video and, and kind of figure it out and let me know um, if you don't have groups on Thursday. Um, okay, so um, that's lab reports. Lab reports are generally 100 points. Um, something I should say, let's say we have 11 labs and we end up having like 1100 points. Those points have nothing to do with, they're not uh, equitable to the exam points. So if an exam's worth 200 points and a lab's worth 100, that doesn't mean that an exam's twice as valuable. Um, what it is is the percentage, right? So you might have 11 labs and they're worth a total of 20%. Uh, basically, that'll mean that if you skipped a lab, you would lose 2% of your grade. Um, so you can see kind of what that's worth and whatnot. Um, as I said, quizzes. Quizzes will usually be on the days of the lecture. They'll be open at 8 a.m. and close at midnight. So you'll have all day to do it. They're generally an easy three-part question on something we covered in the last lecture. So we're gonna talk about some stuff today. You might have a quiz on it next week or on, on uh, Wednesday. Now, um, when you do the quizzes, if I go in here and I'm going to show you what a quiz would look like, um, and we'll talk about these two in a minute. Well, let's say quiz zero syllabus, and I go to preview. Um, so it'll have a question. I'll generally leave an open area for you. So this might say, okay, if you have a force of 10 Newtons and an acceleration of two meters per second squared, what is the mass, let's say. You can either type it in here and use the equation editor, which the equation editor is right here, or you can write it on a piece of paper, take a photo and upload it here. So you can upload pictures on here um, and then submit it. Quizzes are usually worth three points. Um, how I grade a quiz is if you show up and take the quiz and do nothing. So you log into the quiz, but you do nothing. I will give you one point. Um, that's basically you took the quiz and you get a point for participation. Two points means you have some major issues in the quiz. Um, you used the wrong equation or you just didn't answer one of the questions. Um, three points is you answered all the questions and you mostly got it right. You might have a math error, okay, but you understood the concept and you got it. Um, the reason why I, I grade them that way is what quizzes are really for is for you to assess yourself. So since quizzes are generally kind of easier questions from the material, if you can't do those, you're in trouble and you better get to studying, right? So if you know you're doing bad on quizzes, it's because you're not reading the book, you're not reading the material, you're not trying to do some of the homework, you have no idea what's going on, right? Um, so if you find yourself not understanding the quizzes or constantly not getting full credit on quizzes, you better adjust your study habits, right? And that's all they're really for. They're, they're a way to check and get you into kind of testing mode, you know, um, even though you don't have a time limit. Um, so um, what are these two things? Well, um, sorry, what are these two quizzes? The two quizzes that are on there so far, um, are due July 2nd. Um, so they're due, whatever, two, a week from Friday, I think. One is the syllabus, one is the IO lab. On the IO lab quiz, I just want you to take a picture of your serial number that's inside the bottom thing of your IO lab and post it. So I know that you got your IO lab. For the um, syllabus, 
the last page of the syllabus has a thing to sign, which is basically a statement that you read it and you received it. So if you go all the way to the end here, sign your name, take a picture and post it to this. And they're your first two quizzes. They're worth three points. So they're basically extra credit. Um, so that was lab, that was quizzes. Exams are in person or are, I mean, online. I don't use Proctorio. Um, basically when you see my exams, there's a lot of writing to do. It's pretty obvious if you know what you're doing and if you don't. Um, as far as being online, I want your cameras on, your microphones off for exams. I want to be able to see that you're not on your phone and that you're obviously working on your test and not, you know, searching the internet or talking to other people. Um, you'll be marked off for things like not correct units and things like that. However, um, when the exam's over, I'll clearly give you what you lost points on on each part of the question. Um, if you cannot make an exam for some reason, let me know ASAP that you're going to miss it and I'll arrange for you to take a different exam at a different time. But honestly, the only reason why I really want you to be missing exams is if something, an emergency happens or whatnot, right? Um, you guys know why you can miss exams and why you can't, right? Um, but you'll be online, camera on. Um, you'll be able to use notes. You'll be able to use your text. You'll be able to use any class materials that you've been given. Um, so you shouldn't need to cheat. Here's the thing about cheating that's kind of funny that people don't realize in physics. Everyone kind of messes up problems in their own way. And if I see four or five people that all messed up the problem the exact same way, it's obvious that they were talking to each other. And unfortunately, you know, the ones I catch are the ones that do it wrong because if I see it right, right? But sometimes I'll, I'll notice, especially people that are, are lab partners, that you guys are solving problems the exact same way. And that is a dead giveaway that you, um, that is a dead giveaway that you were talking and getting answers from each other. Don't do it. I don't wanna have to, to call you out on it. Um, and in fact, during the exam, if I think something's going on, I might text you or I might send you a chat message. I might just turn my mic on and say, hey, sorry to use Ava. Um, say, hey, Ava, looks like you're talking to someone. Stop doing that. Um, I'll just call you out in front of everybody. It's embarrassing. It tends to stop people from doing it. Um, but if I do think that there's an issue, if I do think someone has seriously cheated, I will talk to you and then I might have to refer it up. Um, so don't cheat, please. You'll see when you see the test, it, it's almost impossible to cheat. Um, you can cheat, I shouldn't say that, but you have to, to write up things and it's pretty obvious that you don't know what you're doing and you just wrote stuff that someone told you. So anyway, we'll talk about that later. Um, I hate talking about cheating. Anyway, if anyone has ADA, um, um, so you are um, going through our IVCs and I don't know why I'm forgetting the name of it right now. Um, but if you need accommodations for testing, note taking, all that good stuff, let me know. Um, anything that you need, I will be happy to accommodate as best as I can. Here is the tentative schedule. And you can see it's all here in red is either a holiday or exams and reviews. Um, you can see that I scheduled the final Tuesday and Wednesday for final review. The final is on chapter 11, 12, 13, and 15, and we'll probably have one question that's comprehensive. Um, but otherwise, it's the material between the exams that you need to worry about. So exam one is chapter one to six, exam two is chapter seven to 10 and 14, 
final exam is 11, 12, 13, 15, and a conceptual or a cumulative type problem. So you might get a projectile motion problem um, on the final, just something to make sure that you learned. Okay. Um, and then student learning outcomes, these are basically what we call SLOs. At the end of the class, we will take an SLO test, which will be five multiple choice questions. You'll not be judged on whether you get them right or wrong. It's just to show us what we did well and what we didn't do so well, which topics we kind of taught you well and which we didn't. But we'll get to that when we get to the end of the summer. Um, this section is really important. Um, as I said, if you want to be successful, make sure you're reading the book beforehand. Don't read it. <coughs> don't um, don't read it. You know, don't try to memorize the text. Just skim through it while you're watching TV or um, you know having lunch with someone and you have your book with you. Just skim through it so that you know what we're talking about. You kind of understand the key terms before lecture. Then after lecture, go back and read it more thoroughly and highlight stuff that's important. Um, and try the problems, cover the solutions to the example problems and try them on your own and see if you understand them. Um, see if they make sense to you and then try to work through their solutions on those example problems. Um, homework, we don't have enough time to do enough homework to really get good at this. If you can, do some practice problems. If you can, do some other problems from the book. Um, Google whatever we're doing, right? If we're doing free fall problems, Google physics free fall problem. Watch a video or two on it. See if it helps you kind of get it to sink in. Um, do as much as you can though. Um, the thing I will say is the real problem with physics is every problem is unique. So you might know how to solve one problem and memorize that. And it's of little to no help with a different free fall problem. That's, that's the challenge here. You've got to learn how to solve problems, any problem. Um, attempt your homework independently, give yourself time to work through challenging problems and then study with other people and help others understand problems you've already mastered. It'll help reinforce those problems. Obviously get help, um, get help at the tutoring center, get help through me, get help through your peers. And then finally, um, and this is kind of something that good students do, if you really wanna solve these problems, you need to understand the concepts underneath them. So go and explore those, okay? Watch videos, um, watch things like, uh, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, Cosmos show or whatever, watch physics stuff, read books on physics stuff, read Wikipedia articles on physics stuff. Even if you don't understand it, just kind of dig in and, and learn the material. Now, um, this is summer. And so I'm saying all that, but we don't have time to do all that. So note how fast um, class is eight weeks. And of that eight weeks, you know, essentially the final week is a quick lab that we're gonna do in class on oscillations and some review in a final. So really it's seven weeks. Um, and basically one of those seven weeks is review in exam one and review in exam two, right? Two days for each of them. So we have no time. We're gonna be flying through this stuff. In order to help you with that, like I said, the homework assignments for the first exam are all here. They're all available to you already and they're all due the day of the exam so that you can get them done before the exam. Um, now you might see that and go, cool, I have plenty of time to do those. No, the reason why I gave them to you is so that you can get started earlier on stuff that um, we haven't covered yet if you wanna try it. 
at least try and understand the problems, right? So if you wanna work ahead, I suggest you do. Summer goes by so fast. Um, it's available to you to get that stuff done. And then you'll log in on the days of lecture, Mondays and Wednesdays, and take quizzes that you'll have to take throughout the day. Um, and then your lab reports will basically be due on Fridays. So the lab of the previous week will be due on the following Friday, right? Um, and that's how we're going to go. So you're going to need to stay on top of it. Lab days, we're going to collect data and go through analysis. And then you'll need to write conclusions and table of results and some other stuff, answer some questions. But we'll try to get the lab, the hard part of the lab done on the lab during the lab portion so that you can do the easy stuff and then mostly work on understanding problems, okay? Um, I'm gonna try really hard to do that. Um, and you'll see as we go. So, okay, all that's good and well and fun and done for now. Um, make sure this week that you can pick up your ILF. Um, Wiley Plus is our textbook. So let's talk a little bit about some of this other stuff. I don't know who that is. Hopefully that's not someone that shouldn't be in here. Um, bah, 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 bah. Um, let me check one last thing. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Um, and generally, I won't take breaks. If you need, if you need to leave and and go um, get water, or go take a ten minute break. That's fine. These things are going to be recorded, and you probably won't miss much. I hope. Um, as I said, chapter one is really, really super easy. It, there's nothing in chapter one. Chapter one talks about um, basically units and quantities. Um, if you read through it, if you go to Wiley course resources, and then you can click on chapter one, which they call measurement, measuring things. You can read through this. It's mostly information, okay, um, about systems of units, um, what we call SI units, which I'll go through soon, um, the names of different um, powers of 10, unit chaining, which we'll do, um, and then the things that make up length and time and matter. So, okay, so let's talk about these things. Um, SI units. The SI units come down to kilograms for mass, um, meters for length, and seconds for time. So each of these things is has a standard unit um, that is, it used to be like the meter was a gold bar or a silver bar or a platinum bar or whatever. Now they generally use atomic things like the, um, the wavelength of a certain type of light that gives them a precise definition of a meter, um, of a second. Um, and I forget how they find the kilogram, but basically you can look them up and find what the standard is for each of these things. Why do you need them? Well, in science, everyone needs to be taking the same measurements, right? If I tell you that I measure the um, oscillation of an atom as one picosecond, right? Everyone needs to have the same measure of a picosecond. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute, but um, yeah, basically that's what you've got. You've got three different quantities that make up all of our units. And we call our units SI units when we're in kilogram meters seconds. Um, there are other units, notably CGS. If you ever wonder what CGS is, that's centimeters, grams, seconds. It's favored by astronomers because dimensionally it makes numbers nice and 
small. So let's think about this with density. You may know the density of water is one gram per centimeter cubed or one gram per milliliter. A milliliter is a unit of volume of liquid. Uh, for those of you that aren't chemists, it's equal to about a cubic centimeter, a centimeter by centimeter by centimeter. Um, really nice. When you're in centimeter gram seconds, you get one. In the kilograms, meters and seconds, you get 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Generally, when I talk about the density of water, I'm going to use 1,000 kilograms per meter cubed. Um, but it is kind of nice to use CGS units so that you just have the density of water as one. Um, for astronomers who have wavelengths and nanometers, it actually makes sense to use kilograms or centimeters, grams, seconds. There's other units, imperial units, all sorts of other units, obviously inches, you know, um, instead of meters, feet instead of meters, pounds instead of newtons in England. Um, but we're going to use SI units that use only kilograms, meters, and seconds. Now, um, why do we care about units? Units are always a consistency check. Let's say you wanted to find the force and you multiplied a quantity that had kilograms and a quantity that had meters per second. <laughs> well, I know that's not force. Force is kilograms per meter or kilogram meters per second squared. So I can look at the units and realize my math is wrong. Usually that's why we include units. If you ever wonder why your teachers get so mad and, and drill it into you that you have to have the right units, it's because it's a consistency check. It shows you that your math is right. It also helps us remember formulas because F equals MA is Newton's famous formula. That is kilograms, meters per second squared. We know force is a Newton, right? And that this is in what are called Newtons. So knowing a Newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, it helps me remember my formulas sometimes. Um, a few of the units that you need to remember, Newtons are kilogram meters per second squared. A joule is energy. It's a Newton times a meter. So that would be force times distance. If position is let's say X then, force times position gives you something that's energy. That's actually something called work that we'll get to when we get to chapter seven and eight. Um, the amount of work done per second is a watt, and that is something called power. Um, pressure is force over area. That's Pascal's for us. Um, and position, velocity, acceleration we'll go over shortly. Um, linear momentum is meters or is mass times velocity, kilograms per meter per second. Now, um, am I going to get mad at you on a test if you leave off your units? Probably not. Um, I will be mad if your units are wrong and I will count you off if your units are wrong. Um, but in general, use units. Um, a force is 10 Newtons, it's not 10. Um, but I'm probably not gonna be super hard on you if you don't have the right units. Or I mean, if you don't have your units listed at all. However, if you tell me that a force is 10 seconds, that is obviously wrong and I will mark that off. Okay, so all this is nice. Um, there's something called chain link. And I should note that when you go back to here, um, in your first assignment, the one that says practice, um, this is, it says math review, but this is really all just problems from chapter one. Um, this has you find, given the radius, find the circumference, surface area, and volume of the earth. That's so that you remember what the formulas are. Um, how many microns are in so many kilometers? That's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, 
using how many, um, if you're given a certain amount of time, translating that into seconds and figuring out how many times something rotates in a given interval. Um, finding the units of, of um, or the number of atoms in the earth, uh, things like that is what mass flow rate we're talking about here. So if you need to find the seconds in a year, how do you do that? Um, you do something called a chain link. Those of you in chemistry already know this. You guys probably all already know this, but what you do, if you wanna convert from one year to something seconds, you start off with one year. How many days are in a year? 365.25 days in one year. Note that you have to make sure that they're on opposite, ones in the numerator, ones in the denominator, so that you can cancel. So now we're in days. Now, how many hours are in a day? 24. 24 hours are in one day. Again, we can cancel that. How many minutes are in an hour? Minutes in one hour. Um, again, I can cancel. Uh, stop it. And then how many seconds are in a minute? 60 seconds in one minute. And I can cancel that. And so I get one times 365.25 days times 24 times 60 times 60 equals pi times 10 to the seventh seconds. Now, I'll let you do that in your calculator if you want. This is an astronomy trick. Turns out it's about 3.14, um, 365.25 times 24 times 60 times 60 is 3155,600. Um, stop it. Three one five five seven six hundred seconds, um, which is about three point one five um, times ten to the seventh. Why are these things so? Which actually I should write the correct way. Or thirty one million seconds. Um, that you may need to do. <coughs> One thing I will caution you on. Okay. If I wanted to convert from, let's say, two meters cubed to centimeters, okay, and I want to get to centimeters cubed. Now, this is two meters, two meters, I'm sorry, um, let me go back one, um, two meters, or two meters times meters times meters. For each of these, I need to convert them into centimeters. There are a hundred centimeters in one meter and I need to do that three times, okay? Once for each one of them, right? Centimeters, centimeter. So it would be two times 100 times 100 times 100. I don't know why, which is, two times 10 to the six centimeters cubed. Some people only do it once um, when they're converting from meters to centimeters. Don't forget that you have to do it for each one of them. So it ends up being a pretty big number um, when you have cubed and squared things. Okay, um, I will also say that um, if I, I'm not sure if I put them somewhere else, but knowing the metric system, um, suffixes or powers of tens. So we have meters, we have centimeters, which there are a hundred centimeters in one meter, or it's one times 10 to the minus two meters. So 0 0.01 meters is a centimeter, right? Ten or one times 10 to the minus two. A millimeter 
is 0 0.001 is 10 to the minus three meters. I'm leaving out the one times 10 to the three. A micrometer is one times 10 to the minus six meters. A nanometer is one times 10 to the minus nine meters. A picometer is one times 10 to the minus 12 meters. There's something called an angstrom, which is a weird unit, one times 10 to the minus 10 meters. It's again used by astronomers because it makes numbers nice. Going the other way, what you write is kilometer is a thousand meters or one times 10 to the third meters, right? That's a kilometer. Um, the next one is a meg, uh, you really don't write mega meters, but you might write like mega joules or mega volts. Mega is one times 10 to the sixth of whatever you have. So let's say this is mega volts is one times 10 to the six volts. It's a million. Um, and then you might have bigger numbers than that, but in general, you don't go too much bigger. So the only ones you need to remember that you'll see for the most part, millimeters are 10 to the minus three, microns are 10 to the minus six, nano is 10 to the minus nine, angstrom 10 to the minus 10, pico 10 to the minus 12. Um, know those for Wiley, because Wiley might give you a number like, you know, four picometers. And they expect you to know that that is four times 10 to the minus 12. Um, so yeah, just make sure you know those. As far as math, um, the rest of this, I'm gonna talk about math. I don't know how far I'm gonna get in the vector stuff, um, but I need to talk to you a little bit about math right now. Um, for some reason, a lot of us don't know trigonometry. I remember myself when I started physics, I was like, wait, when did I learn trigonometry? I didn't remember ever learning trigonometry. Cosine, sine, tangent, Sokotoa, all that stuff. Uh, law of cosines, law of sines. I didn't remember learning it ever. I had to teach myself it. Um, trigonometry is super important for us. And I'll try to explain that as we talk about vectors. Um, integration, obviously, differentiation, min maxing, and then areas, volumes, and graphs. Um, those are the things that you need to make sure that you kind of have down. And when I talk about integration, I just mean simple, the simple functions that you know, you know, how to integrate x squared, how to integrate sine or cosine. Same with differentiation. We're not going to get too crazy. Um, in general, what you're going to see is integration and differentiation in the derivations. But what we'll have is mostly algebra. Um, so don't be worried that you're going to have to do a whole bunch of integrals in the class. You probably won't do more than one, maybe two. Um, you might do some differentiation. Um, but OK, let's talk about trig. So why are we going to talk about trig? I'm going to talk a little bit about vectors for a minute. Um, for those of you that don't know what a vector is, a vector is a mathematical object that gives not only magnitude, but direction. Um, and the reason why we need that is we need to be able to talk about things like velocity and acceleration and forces and torque and all sorts of cool things. So we need some way to show which way something's moving, but it's actually more than that. It actually turns out to be much, much more than that. So this might be V of our particle, let's say, and it's at 20 degrees or something. Um, the really nice thing about vectors is we can break them into components, which we'll talk about on the second part of this. It's actually the chapter three stuff. But in order to break a vector into a component, you treat it like it's the hypotenuse of a triangle aligned to, let's say, the x-axis. So our x-axis is like here, and we have 
some 20 degrees, and let's say this vector is 10 meters per second. So 10 meters per second is our hypotenuse. Well, we can break this up into essentially a V of Y and a V of X vector, which look exactly like the X and Y components of a triangle in right triangle trigonometry. Um, you're going to need to know how to do that. If you don't know how to do that, if you haven't done this in a while, you need to be able to break vectors up into X and Y components. You need to understand how to do that and also how to find an angle if you don't know that angle. So here, what we would have is we would have V of X is V magnitude cosine of whatever our angle is. And V Y is V magnitude sine because this in right triangle trigonometry, y is hypotenuse sine of the angle, x is hypotenuse cos of the angle, where this is the angle and this is the hypotenuse length. From that, we get some other things. Um, we know that the hypotenuse squared is equal to x squared plus y squared. Putting those here, that is h squared cos squared. Um, let me move this over. Plus h squared sine squared theta, which is h squared cos of the angle squared plus sine of the angle squared. But we know this is one, so we see that it's the hypotenuse squared is equal to x squared y squared. Now, you can either say that that proves cos squared plus sine squared equals one, which is actually Pythagorean theorem and is one of the most important theorems in trigonometry. Um, or um, you could say that it proves, using that to prove that h squared equals x squared plus y squared. Um, don't really care either way, but these are the two things that you need to remember. And if you don't remember the Pythagorean theorem, make sure you know it. So know this. From this, um, we also get, well, I should say from this, h cos theta is equal to x. If you move h over, right? So let's erase this. Um, we see that cos of the angle is equal to, I'm calling the hypotenuse R here, but let's call it, well, I'll call it R here then too. You can see that this gives you this. Same with sine. If R sine theta is equal to Y, then dividing by R on both sides and canceling it, sine of theta is Y over R. Tan of theta, theta is Y over X. This is conveniently remembered using Soka Toa, which sounds like a weird Hawaiian name or, or Pacific Islander name to me. Um, Soka Toa, though, stands for sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Adjacent meaning X, opposite meaning Y. Tangent is opposite over adjacent, Y over X. This is all true if this is our angle. Um, now, another thing you need to know is in right angle trigonometry, all the interior angles add up to 180. So therefore, theta plus phi have to equal 90 degrees. So if theta is 20, phi, this is phi. If this is 20, this is 70 because this angle is 90 degrees. That's important to know too, because sometimes you know one angle and you need to get the other angle. Um, Sokotoa is helpful because it'll give you the angle if you don't know it. So let's say I knew my hypotenuse was 10 and my X was three and I wanted to find the angle. Well, the angle here 
if I have cos of the angle is x over r, I can multiply by arc cosine. It's a funny looking, um, it's cos to the minus one. I don't know why they write it that way. They also write it as arc cosine in your calculator. Um, so when you multiply an arc cosine by a cosine, they cancel. And what you get is theta is arc cosine of x over r. Now, um, you need to know if your calculator is in degrees or radians. So I'm gonna put mine in mode degrees. So arc cosine, of three over 10 is 72.5 degrees in this case, 72.54 degrees, which is nice. So um, if you need to get an angle, Sokotoa lets you remember which one to use. Arc sine, arc tan. One thing I should say is arc tangent is multi-valued. And what that means is, let's look at this really fast. Um, so if we draw the typical xy plane, right? You know that x and y, x and y, x and y, x and y. So if this is our origin, X and Y are both positive. X is negative, Y is positive. X is negative, Y is negative. X is positive, Y is negative. Tangent, when you write, um, let's say the arc angle is arc tan of Y over X. Remember from Sokotoa, tangent of the angle is Y over X. So if I multiply through by arc tan, I can get this angle. However, your calculator doesn't know if it's negative y over negative x or positive y over positive x. So let me do this. Let's say I know that I want the angle 30, right? So um, to get 30, right? Um, let me do this really fast. Let's say x and y um, for an angle of 30 degrees, uh, 10, 8.6, and uh, 10, and 5. Um, okay, so I know it should be 30 degrees if my x is 8.66 and my y is 5. Okay. So I wanna know this angle though, right? So I go, oh, I know my y and my x. So, so Katoa, I'm gonna find the angle from arc tan of five over 8.66. Now, um, chances are good that my, um, calculator is gonna give me the correct 30 degrees, which it does. But what if instead this is negative five over negative 8.66 and I put it in my calculator that way? Negative five over negative 8.66. It still gives me 30 degrees. My calculator doesn't know what angle this should be when it really should be this if I have negative five, negative 8.66, okay? We'll talk more about that as it comes up, but you always need to draw a picture of what you're doing when you do tangent and make sure you get the right angle. In this case, my angle should be, just drawing this correctly, 30 degrees, 30 degrees. This is also 30, this is 30, 180. So this whole thing is actually 210. So the correct angle would be positive 210 or negative, um, what is that? Negative 150, um, either way. Okay, so that's that. Inverse functions we just talked about. Um, these are really the uh, functions you need to know. You need to be able to break 
a vector into its X and Y components, which is identical to breaking a um, right triangle into its X and Y lengths. Um, for a vector, let's call it a vector V. The magnitude is Vx plus Vy squared, square root. If I take the square root of both sides of this, right, I see that I get h is equal to plus or minus x squared plus y squared, right? Um, vectors work the same. The magnitude is vx squared plus vy squared, where vx and vy are the magnitude times cosine of the angle that the vector makes with x, magnitude times sine of the angle that it makes with y. Um, if you remember those, that's a huge step forward. Well, I'm gonna go through and show you some stuff on that soon. Um, another thing that comes up is the law of cosines and the double angle formula. These aren't as important, um, but let me show you the law of cosines really fast. Um, so when you have a non, well, I guess it does work for a right triangle as well. But let's say you have three interior angles. You know that they add up to 180 degrees. So what we usually write is A, B, and C all add up to 180 degrees because they're interior angles. Um, directly across from each one, you write little a, little b, and little c, where these are the lengths from here to here, here to here, and here to here. So the big letters are the angles, the little lengths are the little letters are the lengths. And from that, you get um, what we say, I should really actually write this a little bit different. Um, I'm gonna switch these, I'm sorry. Um, the standard form of this is usually written like, um, bah, bah, bah. I'm actually writing them. You'll see um, little a and little or big A. So the standard form of this is c squared um, is equal to a squared plus b squared plus 2ab, or is it minus, angle of c. Um, yeah, minus, sorry. Um, brain's starting to fade. minus. So you might look at this and go, well, what do I care about that? So let's say you have some physics problem where you know the lengths A, B, and C, and you need to find the interior angles for some reason. Okay. So if I need to find the angle C by some rearranging, I can move this over to A, B, cos angle C and move that over is A squared plus B squared minus C squared. All I did was I subtracted C squared both sides, added 2AB cos angle C to both sides, which is A squared plus B squared minus C squared over 2AB. Taking the arc cosine of both sides would give you that angle. Um, you could actually then go around and do all of your angles, A, B, and C. Just remember when you do that, if say I wanted A in this formula, this would be A squared is C squared plus B squared minus two CB cos angle A, right? You have to change them um, based on what angles you're talking about and what lengths you're talking about. But law of cosines is really nice. It's really easy to prove with something called vector multiplication which we'll get into in a minute, but um, yeah, make sure you remember the law of cosines because it's necessary sometimes. The other thing is the sine of two theta is sine theta cos theta times two theta. This is called a double angle formula. There's also um, what are called angle addition formulas. And I believe this is right, but I would have to double check myself. 
Um, I think that's right. Um, I may have that wrong. Um, so I should actually look that up and not tell you that right now. Um, but you can look them up. This one comes up in projectile motion, the double angle formula for sine. So know it, write it down somewhere. Um, we'll talk about it again when we talk about projectile motion. Um, it's actually helpful to just maybe print out a list of the trigonomic identities uh, and different formulas for cos and sine and tangent and keep them because you never know when you're going to need them. Um, if you don't remember the quadratic formula, make sure you remember it. We oftentimes are going to have something where we have like 4x squared minus 2x plus 10 is equal to zero. This could be written differently. This could be 2x minus 10 is equal to 4x squared, let's say. You would move it into quadratic form. Quadratic form means you have a power squared, a power, and a constant term. When you have this and you want to know what x is, you use the quadratic formula. Now, what is the quadratic formula? Well, whatever the coefficient on x squared is, is your a. So here, a is 4. The coefficient on your x term is b. So b is minus 2. And your constant term is your c. If I put that in this formula, I get minus minus 2 plus minus minus 2 squared minus 4 times 4 times 10. OK. Now, I have a problem here. Um, I actually messed this up. Um, let me make this a 3, and let me make this a 1. So I'm sorry about that. Um, so I'm going to make this a 1. This will be a 3. The reason why is I cannot have a negative sign under my roots in this class. That's something called an imaginary number. Um, it has to do with rotation in the complex plane. Don't worry about that. Just know that if you get a negative sign under your root, you've got something wrong or I've done something wrong in the question. So um, over two times four, this ends up being minus minus two. So two plus or minus, minus three squared is minus three times minus three, so nine. Minus four times four times one is eight, right? Um, and put that over, so I changed these, right? To three and one um, over eight. So this is two over eight plus or minus square root of one, which is one. So this answer is either. So our answer here would be either one eighth, which is two minus one, or three eighths square root of one is one, right? Um, Neither one of those is negative. If we had time and time, um, so in say this one where we have x squared minus 2x minus 8, so our a is 1, there's always assumed to be a 1 coefficient, minus 2 and minus 8. Plugging those numbers in, minus 2 squared is 4, minus 4 times 1 minus 8, you get 2 plus or minus square root of 6, 36 over 2. Square root of 36 is 6. So 2 plus 6 is 8 over 2, or 4. And 2 minus 6 is minus 4 over 2, or minus 2. Now let's say this was an equation for time, right? We were trying to find our time. Would negative time make sense? And the answer is no, right? The reason why we usually will see this, we'll see this in, say, projectile motion, where we have let's say this is time and this is the y-axis and it's launched at some point and it comes down. But you'll have what your um, quadratic equation is actually showing you is, and I don't know why I'm, what your quadratic equation is showing you is when this equation ax squared plus bx um, plus c, 
and I'll just make these big Bs. It's telling you when this equation equals zero. So you can get a negative time if this X is time, for example. And that negative time means the time when it crossed the axis where Y is zero and one will be negative, one will be positive. Obviously negative time doesn't matter to us in this case. It's a perfectly legitimate solution to that equation, but physically it's unimportant to us. Physically, we don't care. The math is giving us an answer, but it's not an answer in our realm of interest, right? And that's going to happen. So make sure when you do use the quadratic, make sure that you keep the negative sign or discard it depending on what you're worried about, basically. Another thing I wanna talk about here is degrees and radians. <laughs> um, you need to remember that degrees are a human invention. We basically decided that a circle could be divided up into 360 of what we call degrees. Now, pi, and not to get too weird about this, but a circumference is two pi r and a diameter is two r. Diameter of a circle is, you know, the length all the way across and it's double the radius. So the circumference over the diameter is two pi r over two r and cancel the two, cancel the r's, you get pi. Well, it turns out that there are two pi um, radians in a circle, right? Um, a circle has two pi radians, where radians are an angle of measure. Radians are a real number. So if I was to multiply, you know, four times 0.6 radians, that would give me 2.4. If I was to multiply four times six degrees, that would give me 24 degrees, but that doesn't mean anything. That's just degrees. Um, degrees are not useful when we actually need numbers. Um, so basically any equation that we're dealing with a theta all by itself is like as X, you know, or Y, where theta is a variable all on its own and it's not part of sine or cosine or tan or cotan or cosecant. It's just a theta hanging out in the equation. You better be in radians. And the conversion is either two pi rad over 360 degrees or pi rad over 180 degrees. Let's say I wanna convert 90 degrees to radians, right? I know that there are pi rads in, oh, and I just did that backwards, sorry. There are pi rads in 180 degrees. Cancel the degrees, 90 over 180 is a half, so this becomes pi half radians, okay? You can always convert into radians by hand. Um, a lot of times forgetting to change your mode into degrees or radians is going to mess up your calculator calculation. Um, but generally the rule of thumb is if you have the theta by itself in an equation, you better be in radians. Radians are real numbers. Degrees and radians are not units. They are not real units. Um, essentially, they are just a marker. Um, the argument of sine or cosine or tangent should not have units, okay? Um, it, it should never have units. And that doesn't mean that it doesn't have units of radians or, or degrees, but degrees and radians aren't real units. They're just kind of a, a placeholder for units so that we know that we're talking about rotations. All right, integration. As I said, um, one of Newton's big triumphs was integration. 
And he realized that if I wanted to add a whole bunch of things together, so let's say I have a whole bunch of groups and I'm gonna name each of the groups X1, X2, X3, and I need to add them all um, from zero to 59 or whatever, how many different of these I have, right? Um, what he realized is that big sum could be taken to be an integral. So this integral is the integral of x dx, where, and I'm not going to bore you with this, but dx is some small little infinitesimal, and you're basically summing all the functions from some interval a to b. Now, if we have, and this is our x, and we go from, let's say, um, I'm sorry, I should probably do it like this, actually. We go from A to B, right? And let's say X is five and it's constant here. Well, if X is five, then it comes out and we go A to B DX, which just ends up being five times B minus A, right? That's what this integral gives you. Doing this integral correctly, you get five times X where X goes from B to A. So you get five times B minus five times A. That shows you that what integration also is, is the area under a curve, right? That's really, really important. Sometimes you get integrals you cannot do. You cannot do mathematically without using really crazy methods, but you can use a method where you slice this up into little areas. For example, what if we wanted to do this triangle? Well, this triangle is actually pretty easy, but what if we wanted to do instead this and a triangle, right? So this function actually changes. And let's say this is two and this is three, and this is two and this is three, right? And we wanna figure out what this ends up being. What is the area under this curve? Well, this section is two times two, so that's four. And this section is one times two, so plus two. And this section, which is one by one, one by one, a triangle has an area of one half base times height. One half one times one is one half. And I can see that this is six and one half. 6.5 is that integral. The integral is a sum. It's a really big infinite sum usually. And it's also the area under a curve. Now, you might have noticed that I actually, for those of you that know math, I actually used a, um, oh my God, now my brain just froze. Basically when you have a function that it's just a general function, a dx, so that you get some answer plus a constant term. Well, that happens when you don't put limits. I put limits on things. Um, you should remember some of the easy um, integrals. Remember that integration actually goes up. So x dx from a to b is x squared over two. You add one, divide by the new, go from B to A, which is B squared over two minus A squared over two, right? Um, know that when you go up sine of X dx, um, the integral of sine is what? Cosine with a minus, I have that right. So the derivative of cosine, and I might mess this up, so. Minus sine. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, so if I want to go the other way, um, I would get minus cosine, right? Anyway, make sure you know those sine, cosine, x squared, um, all the ones that you're used to, one over x is ln of x. I'm not going to take you through all those. You guys should know them or look them up. But all the simple ones um, that are, are pretty much standard. You're not going to get something like sine cos squared dx in this class. Trust me. 
but you may need to be able to integrate um, something like, um, sorry, uh, you might need to integrate something like x to the third plus four x, right? Um, or differentiate it. So just go back through and make sure you know them for sine and cos and tan, x, x squared, you know, maybe one over x. Um, make sure you know e to the x, stuff like that. Um, differentiation, however, is a bigger issue. Differentiation is basically, if I have some function, let's say x is, or let's say f is a function of x and it's equal to 5x squared. Taking the derivative, the derivative is a rate of change. So basically I'm taking my function and I'm figuring out how it changes with x, right? That's the mathematical way to write this. And so I would get the derivative with respect to x of this. And what you do is you bring the um, exponent down, subtract one. So this would equal 10 x to the first power. So 10 x, right? Um, that's not hard to do and, and learning them like d dx of sine of x is um, cos of x. I'm sorry. What did I just do? It's cos of x. <clears throat> the derivative of cos of x is sine of x with a negative sign, okay? Remember that, know that. Um, know also how to do powers. Powers are super easy. Remember that differentiation also gives you the minimum or maximum of a function. So if I want to find the zero of this, I take the derivative of my function and I set it equal to zero. So my derivative of my function here was 10x is equal to zero. And I can see that x has to be zero. Um, that's not hard to do. You can find the minimum or maximum of a function by setting the derivative equal to zero. Um, now, why do those things work? Okay. Those things work because when you graph a function, um, bu 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 sorry remember what I'm doing right now. Let's say that I graph a couple of functions. Um, this is going to be my f of x and this will be my x. And let's say it goes like this. So this function is just x, right? Okay. The derivative of this function, if f of x is just x, the derivative of f of x is one. That means that on this graph, if, right, this point would be one, one, this point would be say three, three and on and upward. It means that this slope is actually one to one. Remember the slope is the change of Y over the change of X where this is my Y axis and this is my X axis. This could be time or a function or power or whatever have you, but I'm calling it Y. So this means that my slope is identical to the derivative of my function at each point. Um, that's really helpful to know. So when we have a cosine, cosine starts at one and it goes down, crosses zero to negative one and comes back up. This is cosine, okay? Cosine of theta and let's say this is theta. Okay, well, if you were to graph the slope of this line, just looking at it, a slope that is flat is zero. There's no change of y over change of x. So here the slope is zero and it's positive, but decreasing to zero, okay? That means that it starts off at zero and gets more and more and more and more negative. Um, 
more and more and more and more negative until it hits zero here, right? So slope is zero, slope is zero. Um, starts at zero until it gets, oh, am I doing this? Hang on a second. Do I have this upside down? Because I feel like I should be going the other way. Why am I losing my mind? I'm sorry, you guys. It's been a long morning already. So it's positive. Um, I'm sorry, it's zero and it's increasing negative. So is that, yeah, that's what it should look like. I'm sorry. Um, until it hits zero. But what I'm, oh, because I'm just being dumb. It hits a maximum and then comes back up and hits there. Now, where is it a maximum negative? When it crosses zero and when it um, crosses zero is positive. So let's call this at pi half and at three pi half. And this is at pi and this is at two pi. So it hits a maximum at pi half and three pi half, and it's zero at pi. That is the slope of a cosine graph, right? Um, now, if you look at that, um, the slope uh, da, 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 is also negative. Uh, da, 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 da. So, Essentially, um, I'm losing my thread here. So um, I'm sorry, you guys. So what I wanted to show you was that the derivative of cosine is sine with a negative sign. So cosine looks like this. And sine looks like this. And that's what's confusing me. I figured out what I was confusing myself on, getting hung up on. So um, you can see that this is actually the graph of sine, and this is the graph of cosine. But the slope of cosine actually starts off as, um, if I flip this, it would go like that. Um, so it starts off at zero. It's slowly getting more and more and more and more positive. Um, this is the graph of negative sine of theta. Um, why are, um, I'm sorry, no, I have this backwards. I'm just losing my mind today, you guys. I don't know why I'm hung up on this. Um, so this is the graph of sine and this is the graph of negative sine. There we go. Okay, so let me just to make sure that I'm not um, being stupid. Graph of sine images. <clears throat> so this is sine. Negative sine would be upside down. So this is negative sine, this is sine. Now, this slope is negative because it's decreasing. Y is decreasing as X increases, right? Um, therefore, it's the same as sine, but negative. Just make sure you know that and that you don't get confused like I was confusing myself just now. Um, but the derivative is the slope of your function at every point. Now, it's a rate of change. So make sure you know the differentiation of simple and trigonomic functions. The ones to remember are um, cos and sine, that the derivative of cos is negative sine, and the derivative of, well, I should say derivative with respect to theta, is just cosine. One's positive, one's negative. Try not to forget those that for any power x to the n, the derivative with respect to x is n times n minus one. Um, e to the x, the derivative with respect to x is simply e to the x. If there's a 
coefficient in front, it comes out. A um, few more of those that you might want that you learned in calculus, they're not too bad. Um, area formulas, area and volume formulas. Make sure that you have a good book or you have a way to write these down. Um, you obviously know that a cube is length times width times height, where this is length, this is width, this is height. Um, a rectangle, for instance, is just length times width. These are area formulas. Um, this is a volume formula, this is area. So area, volume. A uh, sphere would be 4 thirds pi r cubed, which r is the radius. Um, or in terms of diameter, this would be 4 thirds pi d over 2 cubed, which is 4 pi d cubed over 2 times 2 is 8 times 24, which is pi d cubed over 6. Um, a cylinder, the volume is, um, so the area of a disc is pi r squared. And since we have a height h and this has an area of pi r squared, we will get h pi r squared. That's the volume of a cylinder. This is the area of a disc. Um, I think that's about everything that we need to know. Just remember that the area of a disc is pi r squared. Um, the circumference around a circle is two pi r. Um, the volume of a sphere is four thirds pi r squared. Um, surface area is what? Um, two pi r squared? Four pi r squared. Um, surface area of surface area sphere is four pi r squared. Yeah. Um, yeah, they'll be uploaded in about an hour after we're done. So um, area of a sphere is four pi r squared. So that's area. This is volume. Make sure you just know those. I'm just throwing them out there because I assume you all know these volume and area formulas. You've probably done them in calculus. We need them more for lab than problems so much. Um, one other thing that we're going to see often is something called cross-sectional area, which I write as this usually. It's usually A with a little thing. Now imagine you have a sphere and you know that the sphere has an area an outer area of four pi r squared. However, imagine this sphere is in the path of like air that's flowing by. The cross-sectional area is just the amount that it sees. It would look like a disc, right? So that disc would only have a cross-sectional area of pi r squared because it's like the face on. Um, cross-sectional area of, let's say, a wire. Let's say you have a one meter long wire, but that wire has a radius of one millimeter, right? This is the cross-sectional area of it. And that cross-sectional area is, again, pi r squared because it's a disk, basically, it's a circle. Um, so you just multiply pi times one millimeter squared, um, which isn't too bad. It's, what, 3.1514 millimeters squared. So when we get to those, we'll, we'll refresh about that. Um, the graphs is the last thing that I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk a little bit about vectors, but we'll talk more about vectors next time um, as we cover section two, um, chapter two, I should say. Um, so graphs. Graphs are super important. And we're going to talk about this tomorrow because you're going to have some graphs to make tomorrow in our first lab. But graphs are always y versus x, OK? y versus x. What do I mean by that? Let me look up graph. Um, I don't know, temp 
versus pressure. Okay. Or pressure versus temp, let's say here. Now, notice on that graph, this graph is titled pressure versus temperature. Pressure is on the Y. Whatever you title your graph, the Y comes first. The X comes second. So the versus, it's always Y versus X on a graph, okay? Um, that is one of the weird little errors that pops up so often that I, it, it kind of drives me crazy. But knowing that, right, then let's say we have a whole bunch of data points on a graph. The graphs have something called an R squared value and graphs have usually a trend line and we're gonna go through these, but um, this line is usually Y as a function of X. The derivative of this line, so D D X of Y as a function of X is your slope. Okay, but your slope is also the change of y over the change of x, which obviously says dy over dx, little change of y over a little change of x is your slope. Now, if you specify, let's say this gave us a function of x squared for whatever reason, right? The derivative of y gave us um, x squared. That would give us the instantaneous slope at any value of x we choose. And that's usually really important. So when you look at a graph, there's so much you can learn from it. Um, but you need to remember y is always whatever comes first. So if we say, I don't know, temperature versus day, right? That would mean temperature is always on the y. And then you could take the derivative of that function, whatever function you get after graphing that data, you could take the derivative of it and get the rate of change per day of the temperature, let's say. Super important. Why is it important to know graphs? Because we as humans actually can't process information like you might think. Um, we do better with simple ideas. Graphs are a really simple way to express things. And just know that as long as it's y over x, then the derivative of y versus x or with respect to x is the rate of change of y with respect to x. Um, and that's super, super cool that the derivative has a visual meaning. It's not just a fun little math trick to reduce the power of a function down. Um, it really does mean something. And for us, the reason why we need to know that is we're going to talk about position, acceleration, and velocity. So position, excel, um, sorry, position, velocity, and acceleration. So T and excel. Okay. The position of a function, say, is X with respect to T. Let's say that you can walk um, two miles per hour, right? So two times T, where T is in hours, okay? Um, yeah, two, sorry, let me leave that back. You can walk two miles per hour and we want T to be in hours so that we'll get miles out of it for our position function. Um, and actually let me make that T squared just to make this kind of nice. Um, so your position function is two miles per hour squared times T squared, T is in hours. What is our velocity? Well, our velocity is DX of t with respect to t, the first derivative. That would be 4t, right? And this would be 
um, because this is still in miles per hour, this would have units of miles, right? Miles per hour squared times hour squared. Miles per hour times hour, um, I'm sorry, miles per hour squared times hours is miles per hour. And then finally, the velocity with respect to T will give us four, and this would be miles per hour squared. Um, these are units. So what we have here is your position function, we would normally just write two T squared, and it would have units of miles. Taking the derivative of this with respect to T gives us velocity, which is four T, and that is in miles per hour. And then finally, our acceleration is four miles per hour squared. We're going to do this a lot, where we're going to find the acceleration or the velocity or the position based on those things. Um, the reason why I stated it this way is a lot of people have problems understanding what velocity and acceleration are. You kind of know what they are, but you don't know what they are. And they're confusing. Your position at any given time is x. How your position changes with time is known as velocity. And that is the derivative of whatever the function of your position is with respect to time, um, assuming that your position has a time function to it. Um, so speed is the magnitude of the velocity. We'll talk about why we don't ever want to say that next time. But um, speed is basically how your position changes with time. And if you can think of it that way, you know that the rate of change of anything is a derivative. You should have learned that from calculus. Now, how fast your velocity can change is acceleration. And that's where we all kind of have in our head things messed up. If you push on the gas of your car when the light turns green, you push your car accelerator down, you know, you take off all fast. And you think, oh, I accelerated. Well, you did accelerate, but your acceleration is how fast your speed changed. So like a race car can go from zero to 60 in two seconds, right? That zero to 60 miles per hour is the change of the velocity in six seconds, right? The acceleration is the change of the velocity with time. So zero to 60 over six seconds is about 10 miles per hour per second, which is pretty fast, right? But acceleration is how fast your speed changes, not your speed. And people tend to get that messed up in their heads. It, it's a little weird, but basically acceleration is the change of speed. Velocity is the change of position. And position is wherever you happen to be at any given time. Um, if I graph a position graph, and so this is a quick pop quiz, graph a position, what is the slope of x versus t? So the slope of this graph is the derivative of x with respect to t, which is the velocity graph. And it might look something like this, much smaller. That would be velocity versus time. The slope of this graph is the acceleration with respect to time, and it might even look even smaller. Right? So there's a nice link between graphs, slopes, derivatives, and functions, um, and even areas under the curve. Um, so knowing that this, so let's look at that really fast since we only have like one more minute left. Let's look at this really fast. Now, the velocity versus time, let's say, is something like this, right? We know this slope is the acceleration versus time, and it looks like maybe it's constant. But the area under this curve is what? What is the area under the curve of a v versus t graph? Well, take the integral 
of BDT, and what do you get? You get the change in position. The total change in position is the integral of BDT. Um, that's pretty cool. So you can use a graph to see the integral, or you can take the slope or take the derivative to get the slope to find the rate of change. They're all related. Um, make sure you kind of understand that stuff. Um, it's, we'll go through it more every time we use it, particularly in lab, when we make like a velocity versus time graph or an acceleration versus time graph from some position graph. We'll talk about those and re uh, stress that they're derivatives and slopes and all that good stuff. Um, next time, ignore this because next time I am going to cover chapter two, but I'm also going to talk about vectors. Vectors in physics are useful mainly because we can break up motion into X, Y, and Z and handle X, Y, and Z as one dimensional motion. One dimensional motion is a heck of a lot easier than two dimensional motion. Um, and I'll take you through a few more math things when we do the vectors, um, because adding vectors and subtracting vectors is pretty normal, but multiplying vectors is very different. There's something called a cross product. So please do me a favor and kind of glance through chapter three before Wednesday. Um, and a little bit of chapter two, read, read a little bit of constant acceleration um, stuff, and we'll talk about that. Um, if we are a little bit behind, um, it'll be OK, because week three, all we're really doing is chapter six. And chapter six is really just an extension of chapter five. And um, so we're a little bit behind today. I talked way too long about the syllabus. I wanted about a half hour to talk about vectors. And that's OK. Regardless, what I want you to do is, um, if you can, get your iLab. Um, if you do get it, take a picture of the serial, um, serial number and upload it into Canvas under quiz under assignments, quiz zero B. Sign that letter of the syllabus. Just take a picture of that letter part and upload that to quiz zero A. And then um, I didn't talk too much about it, but these practice problems under assignments are really for you to, they're due next week, but um, they're really just for you to try out um, the different things that Wiley does um, and do some of this. Question one, circumference, surface area, volume, not a big deal. I've already gone through this, but microns into kilometers, et cetera. Um, and then tomorrow we'll do a quick graphing lab in class um, and it shouldn't take too long. And we'll go through how to get the IO lab up and running tomorrow. All right, I'll see you guys tomorrow. Um, have a good night. Don't get too stressed. Try out that uh, Wiley for me and I'll see you tomorrow. Professor? Yeah. Uh, I'm on the wait list. Uh, can I talk to you about it after class? Like, right yeah. Now? Yeah. Okay. Um, one other thing before. Uh, oh, I think you left. No, Ahmad? Ahmad, are you here? I think it's Ahmad. Are you gone? Um, let me do this really fast. Um, so, um, welcome everybody. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, yeah. Um, Ahmad, are you here still?
I know you have your, or you've gone, Ahmad. Anyway, um, if you're still here, Ahmad, let me know. Um, oh no, never mind. I uh, never mind. I just realized that I don't need to talk to you, Ahmad. Um, but um, so yeah, we can talk now unless you want to wait a little longer. Uh, okay, I I'm fine. So uh, I I'm on the wait list. I'm on like uh, I'm, my current place is right now twelve. Is there any way like I, I can get in the class? So um, what it looks like, sorry. Um, what it looks like right now is I may have one spot, um, possibly, mm -hmm. possibly. Um, so I and Mina was here. I sent out. Um, uh, hang on one second. Yasmin, yeah, that's absolutely <laughs> fine. Uh, you won't get dropped if you don't join tomorrow. Um, just make sure that you contact me if you're not understanding something and we can take a little bit of time to go over. Um, so as far as where you're at on the, on the wait list, I only have one person that didn't show up um, today. Uh -oh. I'm gonna contact them and let them know um, but I, I need to go back through, uh, we can talk about it tomorrow, Nicolette. Um, I, I want to go back through who emailed me because only about 10 or 12 people emailed me. Hmm. But I would say it's more than likely, I think there is someone ahead of you. I don't remember. Let me stop this for a second, uh, just cause I'm going to go to my site and look at what the wait list looks like right now. Um, uh, I remember last semester, uh, I was on the wait list and the professor said like, uh, she gave out more APC codes than she normally does because it's an online class. There's like not like yeah. physical seats. Is that possible? The problem with that is they get really, I, I totally wish I could. Um, mm -hmm. The problem with that is they get really annoyed with us we're not supposed to go over 30 at all. Um, and what some professors will do is they'll go 32 or 33 people because they know someone's going to drop. Um, I rarely end up with people dropping, which is um, why I don't have to go over. Um, but so you were 12th, you said? Yeah. You're, you're 13th on here? Uh, uh let me oh, let me yeah. check. No, you're third. I I'm looking at mine. You're third. Oh, okay. But the first, there's only like three people in front of you. But I think, I think there's like three people that contacted me in front of you. Um, oh, I see. I'd say the chances are probably not great. But I had mm. somebody that switched out of another class, and I know you probably want to take it with me. But um, if you really need the class. See if you can join another class. Um, I just, I think we're going to be full, to be honest with you. Um, you can check back with me towards the end of the week. Um, I'm okay adding people by the end of the week, but I can't go over 30. So I'm sorry, man. Okay, got it. Cool. All right. Uh, Ava, Brooke, or Ahmad, do you guys need anything? Uh, professor? Yes. So just to make sure, um, we meet live on Zoom for every um, lecture and lab session, right? Um, yeah, every, 